Well, yeah, because I remember a lot of the black and white in black and white and black and white too. The gyms were really interesting because it was like you they were puzzles that you had to mm. figure out. Exactly. The gyms themselves were puzzles. Yeah, there was one where you had like a road thing and you, the platform could only move yeah, you had ways like You had like ones stuff. with roller coasters and mine carts and all this kind of shit. Yeah. Why, why can't you do that in like, make it like a Zelda dungeon. Yeah. If you're going to do Breath of the Wild, make it like a Zelda dungeon. Give this guy back his wallet. Cool. <laughs> then win at an auction. What the fuck is win at, what do you mean win at an auction? <laughs> Welcome to Magic the Flavoring, the Magic the Gathering podcast, where we talk about all things magic, flavor design, and lore. I'm your host, Andy Mann. Hello, this is Nathan Cancel. And we are all warmed up after recording a mini podcast about the latest Pokemon game that will never be released. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh, we, did, we didn't have record for that, though, did we? we haven't got uh, I pressed this. record. We, I've been recording for six minutes, so you'll get the last six minutes of me going, the gym tests aren't even a thing. They don't even do anything. <laughs> God, yeah, yeah. Well, it was what, it was. We get thirty minutes, thirty minutes of us chatting about Pokemon. Yeah, a minute so. for each year of our lives, mm. for talking about a game aimed at ten-year-olds. At least this game is for fourteen years and older, and now we get to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now we can feel like we're not um, lowbrowing it too, yeah. too deeply. <laughs> if you've also been playing either Pokemon Scarlet or Violet, hit us up at MT Flavoring on Twitter um, and tell us what you think. <laughs> I'm in the minority. I really am struggling with this one, but I, everyone else seems to be loving it. We're not getting into it. We are talking about Jumpstart today. Not yes. Jumpstart, Jumpstart. We're talking about Jumpstart 2022. Not yeah, the Dominaria. Set, the set, not the mechanic. Yeah, not Jumpstart Dominaria United, which I did buy a couple of packs of about three or four weeks ago, not thinking or realising. I say not realising. I didn't know that they were going to be doing like a mainline Jumpstart set. I was teaching someone how to play Magic. The Dominaria Jumpstarts were there. They are Garbo. I did um, get a, a, oh my gosh, a Simeon Elder. Is that what it's called? What's the green method? The green one, yeah. The, 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 um, the Silverback. Silverback, Silverback, Silverback Elder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did pull that in one of them. Um, and I've since good. seen a lot of uh, reviews of the Jumpstart Dominaria one. And indeed this one that show that the actual set itself as a Jumpstart product is maybe not living up to the hype, much like the Baldur's Gate product wasn't necessarily a Commander Legends product. Like, they seem mm. to be using the names. Anyway, we're not talking necessarily, or at least I'm not, because this you're doing the lead on this, but we're not talking necessarily about this as a whole product, or even maybe as a jumpstart product per se, but as ever, here on Magic the Flavoring, we're going to be talking about the flavour of the 14-1-4 new legendaries in the set. Yes, there are more commanders for your commander decks found in a non-commander product. <laughs> Why did you want to talk about this set? Uh, well, one of the nicest things I think about having a multiverse, um, to kind of a multiverse playground is that sometimes you don't get a big old chunk of of flavor and lore. Like with a new set coming out, you're not in, you're not in chapter seven of an arc. You're just throwing out a little bit of of ancillary flavor of the multiverse. Mm. And I feel like jump starts uh, the linked the link sets ones fine cool whatever i think it is still as as you were saying like you were teaching someone how to play magic jumpstart is considered to be one of like the best ways to kind of just like pick up and play um and i like the fact that it's all thematic anyway so individual packs you know have like specific things like soldiers or plus one plus one counters or scry or whatever so typically the commanders that are at, at play have a good degree of mechanical flavor within them anyway um, and it's nice to see these w- random ones that are like, you know, unaffiliated to any particular plane because we're going to get to see as, you know, we're going forwards, some old names, some reimaginings, maybe, a, maybe, maybe a, a version of a card you weren't expecting. Mm. Sometimes some big question marks as to, okay, what the fucking hell is this plane? <laughs> well, how, <laughs> how can this character exist? Um, and there's some also cool throwbacks, you know, and they all tend to have, as I said, like quite cool mechanical flavor. So. And there was a few. There was enough of them in here that I thought ah, that's that's worthy of an episode. Yeah, I mean, we've been really heavy into Brothers War and you know Phyrexia, and lo and behold, we're going to be getting first looks at uh, Phyrexia will be one very very shortly. So uh, everyone's getting hyped for that. And as much as I think we've been saying on this podcast for the all of the Dominaria, the latest Dominaria set, like you and I are both well into the Phyrexians. I know they're not for everyone, but we are like super up on them. So it's not that much of a chore for us yet. We might see after the next two sets of being on this story arc whether we get a little bit bored of it. But for right now, we're totally in. And yes, there's product fatigue. Yes, there are way too many cards now in the game. I mean, there are pros and cons. We've spoken about that, blah, 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 blah. But 
I actually, looking through these legendaries, I was all geared up to be like, oh, Nathan wants to talk about these legendaries? I don't know, man. And then I actually looked at them and went, oh, this is kind of nice. <laughs> mm. It's kind of different. It struck me, and this is me being a total hypocrite for all of my ranting and raving on this subject. These cards, I don't know if you feel this way, feel a little bit, just a smidge, just enough, like uh, unset cards. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? They, they play on the right side of almost being parodies. Yeah. But not, not self-serving, like wink, wink, nudge, nudge ourselves, you know, masturbatory kind of parodies, like <laughs> actual genuine, like quirky magic. Mm, mm. Yeah, I agree. There's a couple of them that, although I do like the flavour of them, in a magic setting, I am a bit like, really? You're going to do that? Really? Especially when you lay them out all like next to each other. Mm. Some of them seem like, oh man, fuck, I'm so cool, though, I'm hyped for this Yeti! And then other ones are like, oh, it- it's a monkey! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Already <laughs> blowing which ones I liked and didn't. And I, I actually think, I don't think we're going to agree on a lot of these. Um, But you're doing the lead. I'll shut up. You've done some work. I've done no research on these except for looking at the pretty cardboard. So you go ahead. What do you want to talk about? Right. So we're just going to go through uh, one by one. Um, I've got them in alphabet, not alphabetical order, Weeberg order. Um, so I guess set order. Yeah. Um, um, on my on my scryfall, I've gone through. I've done some commentary on each of them, and then I guess we'll we'll see which which we have more to say about than others, and which ones come out on tops. Mm-hmm. Um, we get to start with what I think is kind of a, 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 an auto win, and that's uh, Argus Cos Eternal Soldier. Uh, three and a white. The annoying thing about these cards, right? It's because they're new. There's a shitload of text on them. That's what yeah. I'm gonna have to do. It's not just like here's the card. Let's talk about it. So I've got to fucking say what it does. Um, right. So it's a three and a white for a three four legendary spirit soldier. Uh, with vigilance, whenever Argus Cos of Eternal Soldier becomes a target of, a, of an ability that targets only it, you may pay one um, and hybrid Boros. If you do copy that ability for each other creature you control, that ability could target. Each copy mm. targets a different one of those creatures. Now, as as, as a Feather player, uh, I'm sure this kind of sings to you a little bit. This is very much a cross between Feather and uh, Zarda, right? In terms yeah, of yeah, like, I also like I got big. Yeah, I used, did used to have a Feather deck, um, and the, being in Boros, I like kind of like the idea that this has a similar effect because it's you know all it, the effect pings off of other creatures having the effect is kind of like an army of one kind of thing. I also got big Ivy vibes because I've just built an Ivy deck. Mm. I like this kind of copying up thing, but in different ways. Am I being silly? And what, mechanically, am I am I right? This is a bit like Ivy as well, no? Yeah, absolutely. Because the thing you're doing, you're being able to then copy across, but it's like for a one time effect. It's the other way, and it's also yeah. reversed. Yeah, exactly. And I, I like. I mean, you know, it does have like some mechanical flavor in terms of whenever you know anything, anything inspirational happens to him, or you know he feels he has a buff, it buffs everyone else on the team. That's not necessarily what's what's so interesting. What I like is the fact that we're getting a lot of like throwback um, Ravnica, especially like Boris Legends. So we got yeah. uh, General Ferris. Rod, Rod, Rockerick recently. Um, we also, I don't think Feather you can count as like a recent card in terms of when it was printed, but in terms of like recent law, like Feather still exists now in the in the current day and age. And the Feather we saw is probably only like a year old or so in, in the yeah, twenty nineteen War of the Spark, wasn't it? It was at the very tail yeah. end. Yeah. So that's three years ago for us, but it's still like a year ago in terms of like like you know canon within the law. So it's nice to see we get a, a version of a Boris legend from from ages ago, and then we also get a spirit version of Argus, kind of showing that he is still about. Though I'm pretty sure the last time we saw him, he was in um, uh, Agrium or whatever it is that that weird spirit. Agrium. Yeah, that spirit version of Ravnica that's laid over the top. So maybe this is still a throwback to when he was um, a spirit serving with the. Uh, fucking azorius for grand augustine or whatever but either way it was nice to see and you see a version of him and if, if you weren't aware this within law is he's brought back as a spirit several yeah, times it's kind, of, <laughs> it's kind of sad i think for the boros and it's so it's on one hand it's like the flavor giveth where it's like hey the boros classically you know the kind of a little bit boring i mean don't let christian gregory hear us say that but like you know they're they're the soldiers they're soldiers they're righteous they're a little bit hot-headed mm. some might think they're authoritarian and they are slightly maybe not as distinct from the Azorius as much as I think Ravnican fans would like. Mm-hmm. They're very sort of similar. Don't, you know, don't at me. Um, so that's nice that we're getting the classic characters who a lot of them were Boros because a lot of the old Ravnican no- novels revolved around a lot of the Boros Legion characters because they make good protagonists because they mm-hmm. are, generally speaking, on the right side and they're proactive. Gen- they are protagonists in how they act. So that's the giveth. The taketh away is that of all the interesting Boros Legion legendaries that we get, they're all characters that are throwbacks. There's very mm. few new characters in Ravnica that have been introduced where you're like, damn, that's cool. Even if you look at like the War of the Spark, 
a lot of the other sort of um, face face cards for the guilds are a lot more interesting. So I kind of feel like, yes, love that we've got Argus Koss. Shame that we don't have, you know, anyone cool except Aurelia, like, repping it for the mm. Boros Legion. I don't know. That's just my thought. Yeah, I'd like to see Feather get another version that isn't But the so... Feather's a throwback character. But, I mean, Feather still exists now, right? That's that's the... I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. It's Again, it's one of those, oh, it's from old law. You yeah. Know? Look, at, look at all of Ravnus <laughs> history. Instead yeah. of, look at Ravnus <laughs> now. Yeah, fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Anyway, anyway we, we won't stay too long. But yeah, Ag- Argus Koss, it's about time they got a cool card. I mean, mm-hmm. I they're also, for those who don't necessarily know, if anyone has the Thespian stage card yes. that land that i also so at um, magic fest birmingham um command fest birmingham i should say i got a, a thespian stage play map as well as a card signed by john avon yeah i got mine signed as well yeah wicked so yeah. cool um and it's actually when you see the play map art when you go oh shit this is zadek and argus uh-huh. Koss. <laughs> like yeah, obviously really it's, cool. it's two actors playing out the battle that they had in the old ravnica novels in the dissension era mm. so yeah pretty cool pretty cool so no, i'd love to see a Sardek, um Re, um, like throwback card as well. Like, why do they? I mean, as much as Boris is cool, so give us Boris cards. Give us, give us. Isn't the other dead? Well. Isn't he he dead? is, but give us a throwback card. You know, I, mean, I know Argus Koss is dead. He's literally a yeah. spirit, but I mean, he's not Zardex yeah. like dead. Yeah, no, he's like gone, gone. Yeah, but yeah. you could give us like a Modern Horizons version. Anyway, moving on. Anyway. Um, Lita, mechanical engineer. Ooh, two and away. Oh, I love yeah. this card. It's cool, cool, cool as fuck. You can't. With, again, we're an audio podcast, so you, can, so you can't see it, but you know, she looks, she looks cool. The internet exists. You're on your phone. Look it up. <laughs> exactly. Um, so two and a white for a legendary artifact creature, artificer, uh, a three-three vigilant. Um, at the beginning of your end step, untap each other artifact creature you control. Three and a white tap. Create a five-five colorless vehicle artifact token named Zeppelin with flying and crew three. Um, so this is a vehicle commander. Yeah. I like this. I mean, it's as much as we already technically had one in the, the Penna or whatever in Amos, like this is quite specifically like not only because it makes vehicles, but it has a really cool synergistic vehicle untapping ability. So you can yeah, play offense I mean, and defense. It's cool. in a, So looking at it from like mechanical flavor, uh, or is that just Mel? Do you know what? The longer we do this podcast, the more I don't think mm. I understand what Mel and Borthos, uh, what Borthos and Mel is. Anyway, <laughs> by the by, I'm sure I do. But you know, sometimes they get bled. I think in, in a bubble, but I like the flavor of this card because they're very clearly a builder of Zeppelins. Like on the card art, in their fl- in their ability text and everything, they are a Zeppelin builder. They're also some. They're an art like an artifact creature. They are themselves an auton- automaton, right? Which is mm. kind of a cool bit of flavor. Whereas the other vehicle commanders that we've got, be it in say uh, Kamigawa and Kaladesh and Penna, mm. yeah, all that kind of stuff, they're all. I mean, Kapen- uh, Kamigawa had like several of them because I was thinking of Grease Fang. True, yeah, actually, yeah. yeah. They're all very... Generic's not a bad... I'm not using that in a bad way, but they're all very much like broadly artifacts you control have or um, uh, vehicles you control have X, Y, Z. Whereas this is, you are creating Zeppelins. And you can have Lita running as a, a vehicle commander in general and then you pack other ones in. You can have mm. them in the 99 of the other decks. But if you wanted to be like, no, we're going to build an army of Zeppelins and smash face... Like I like the fact that it's in a box as well as yeah. a broader idea. You don't have to make it a vehicle deck. She herself makes your artifact deck also. Yeah, a it could be tokens. Deck. It could be a lot of stuff, yeah. and it's just a really nice, cool flavor thing. I, and also, this is on Kaladesh, right? Yes, indeed. It's all filigree. It's all filigree mm-hmm. and like kind of brassy gold-looking motherfuckers. So yeah, yeah, really cool. I would. I, what, my curiosity is whether or not Kal- uh, the fact it's like ether infused, um, because obviously like the uh, ether born are made from ether. Would the ether infusion into a mechanical artifact is like does that create a greater sentience? Like, because obviously as a legendary, this is something don't, I, mean, I don't think we've spoken about. Is, if you're a legendary artifact, is it just because you're one of a kind because of who made you, or do you have like a person, a one of a kind personality, like Khan, for example? Well, I guess that's the difference between being just a construct and being. An artifact, yeah, because she's an artificer, artificer right? She, like, is, she is herself an artificer, yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, yeah, really cool art by uh, Bartek Vidrizak as well. Yeah, really, really um, cool. And yeah, yeah, it's giving a different spin on Kaladesh. It looks like, to me, it looks like Kaladesh has had another advancement in tech. Right, yeah, it feels very much more sleek. Um, yeah. Everything feels a bit. It, it feels almost like Ravnica in, in a little bit. It's like a bron- bron- bronze blonde shirt. Yeah, she, she's not a servo. Show. Like, do you know no. what I mean? She's a full on sentient automaton. Automaton, exactly. Yeah. It's it's giving me um um fuck, what's it called the the thing when you're in the, in the sky ship um by Bio, Bioshock Bioshock Infinite vibes. There we go. Okay, oh, sure, yeah, yeah. Hard yeah. Work. Uh, cool. So. From an artificer to um, a magician. Um, Preston, the Vanisher. Rabbit wizard. Three and 
white for a legendary <laughs> rabbit lit wizard. Yeah, a 2-5. Yeah. Uh, whenever another non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control, if it wasn't cast, create a token that's a copy of that creature, except it's a 0-1 white illusion. One and a white, sacrifice five illusions, exile target non-land permanent. I like the rabbit folk. I like, right. do you know what? I, I think I come across from time to time on this show, as opposed to yourself, as I'm the one that doesn't buy into like magical whimsy. Lawwin is not my favourite set. I couldn't give a shit about unsets. I fucking hate the fact that squirrels are like the meme of magic. But I really love... They they did this one, they did one in Commander Legends. Right? Rain, yeah. Yeah. The Rabbit Wizard. It's it's pure fantasy, it's pure whimsy, but without being like, you know, as we said, masturbatory. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're never gonna get... <laughs> A Christmas card. We never get a Christmas if we keep card. Using, if, we, if we're not pleasant come up with Kenobi and we keep using the words masturbatory in our podcast. <laughs> I mean, look. It's true. What, it's true. It's true. I mean, I think, so beyond the fact that it's the pun of the name, right? Hey, presto, Preston. I mean, that's a little bit the bit that makes me feel like it's like unsetty because they're just kind of wink, wink, nudge, nudge, nudging, like really strongly. Also, of note, I am going to quickly go down the through and realise that not a single one of these... Have you noticed what not a single one of these cards has, Andy? Flavor text. None of them have flavor text. No. So we have to, to a degree, and this is kind of unfortunate because these are such like random, like, unless you can pick out the flavor from which we'll get to on a few of them, which are more obvious. Things like this, like Arquain and Preston from the same set, you know, like from, from the same plane, are they from the same place? Because they don't necessarily like doing this element of an- anthropomorphization, typically, in magic sets. They no. find it's a bit too weird. So are we going to maybe get that? I mean, we, I mean, we can't do like another old drain esque set that isn't law win right so it doesn't feel like we're ever going to no, go to wherever but this I mean, is so no, a bit of flavor would have been nice just yeah. to say like maybe give the name of the plane or whatever and maybe we'll see this because there's a hint of a, of we may, might be doing another planes chase theme in, in the next year or so so maybe we'll get like a lot of these questions answered by random plane True. planes cards it plays as a blink commander um obviously that like, each one of these uh commanders is going to be at the lead of a pack that's thematic so it will have you know uh do this thing to make this thing happen kind of style um to, to, to their abilities i like the fact that it makes a copy of the creature that's really abusable um the fact that it whenever anything appears out of nowhere it creates a greater amount of illusion for your for your opponent and then when you've got enough illusion over your opponent you can make something of theirs vanish mm. Like I mean, maybe that's me leaning too hard into the vorthos of the of, vorthos of the card, you know. But I think no, I know, think it's cool. I, I mean, yeah, cool. I mean, it's it is also classic sort of. How would I describe it? Sort of if you if you are in like a fantasy game or a novel or a piece of media, and you have a magician that's not just like all powerful and godlike, but you want to show them as being like powerful but yet kind of soft. Illusion magic is very much a kind of accessible thing because illusions are seen as being quite benign, but also like mm. very tricksy. Well, that's why I think like Jace gets away with it because there are dark elements of Jace's character where it's like he can break the mind of a sphinx by having a temper tantrum, you know, albeit mm. brought on by childhood trauma. I do get that. Don't at me again. Um, but he's also he makes himself look a little bit more svelte than he really is because of illusion. Yeah, you know? he makes like... himself not look tired. You know, he's a little bit vain. Like, that's the kind of stuff that works. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the fact that, yeah, Preston is, you know, whenever a non-token creature enters battlefield on your control, if it wasn't cast, create a token copy of it, that's a zero one one white illusion. So you can have your blight steals all day long and create blight steals, but a little boop and the illusion pops. Like, I, I really like that. Uh, maybe not on blight still because it'd be indestructible, but do you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. it's nice. It's soft. It's abusable in the right decks. It's a nice light character. Yeah, Preston fires on all cylinders for me. Um, mm-hmm. The right side of whimsy for sure. Coolio. All right. So from um, a rabbit to a fish. Um, no, no joke. It's, it's a landra <laughs> sky dreamer. Two blue blue for a legendary creature. Merfolk. That's got to be speciesist. Call a merfolk a, a fish. Uh, yeah, I mean the fact you can call a Preston of a rabbit. I just feel like it's elitism, right? That's he just is a up. rabbit. Yeah, but it, I'm I, sorry, Murfolk are Murfolk. fish. Anyway, whatever. Um, whenever you, it's a two four. Whenever you draw your second card each turn, create a two two blue Drake creature token mm. with flying. Whenever you draw your fifth card each turn, Alandra Sky Dreamer and Drakes you control each get plus X plus X equal to, um, to an, uh, until end of turn where X is the number of cards in your hand. Yeah. Wife of Talrand? Question mark. Sister of Talrand? Question mark. Daughter of Talrand? Question mark. Not right. related to Talrand at all. We will never know. But Talrand esque, they surely are. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at the. So the thing that actually now I notice more than ever is the thing that made me think Talrand was actually the Drake artwork being very very similar. Um, but I don't actually now think that they are. I mean, let me quickly get Talrand up. 
I think they are part of the same world. Because, I mean, they're Tritons from, if they are called Tritons on that, they're more folk from um, Chandelar, right? Right. Um, and I'm looking, and it's not a million miles away. Yeah, it's not I, a million no, miles I, away. No, 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 I, I think, think they are um, definitely part absolutely. of the same plane. I think it's even deliberately nodded to, like, make the Drakes look a little bit like the Drakes from um, Talrand, uh, Talrand's invocation and Talrand himself. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I think what's kind of interesting, right, is that, it's also the thing that makes me feel like this is that their magic is synergistic. Like the mechanics of the two of mm. them are synergistic, which makes me feel like as a tribe, they probably all have magic that creates or summons, you know, drakes. And I like the idea that, you know, the cards that are drawing you cards, the, the spells that are drawing you cards are more likely to be instants and sorcery. So that's synergistic with Tower Rands. The fact that they're equal in mana cost as well, I think supposed to be a nod. It's basically, it almost feels like plain, a plain chase version of Tower Rand. Yeah. Like if Tower Rand from a different, from a different swing. So. Yeah, yeah, I get you. Yeah, like a like an alternate universe. Mm. I mean, I and Alandra Talran. Yeah, no, it's, it's obviously yeah, definitely a nod. I, yeah, it is an interesting one. I don't know. This is this is where this is where we start to get things like the flavor text really becomes important, and mm. you know, at the the jumpstart original jumpstart had an article on the mothership on the wizard's website which gave you a little blurb it's when they were really hard into doing blurbs for legendary creatures as opposed to online mm. fiction which now looking back on it is actually a fairly useful resource now that we don't have them but at the time everyone was like just write a damn story <laughs> about story. Them. yeah yeah exactly. um but they don't have that for this one and it seems really like a missed opportunity because this one's got people like Alandra. <laughs> it's like, yeah. who the fuck is it? Tower Rand is the most printed legendary, like, per reprint of them all outside of fucking Bosch Iron Golems. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So, like, who is this person? Come on. And yeah. also, it just sc- screams to me, you know, those annoying fucking Tower Rand EDH decks that you thought were dead and buried forever? Well, they're back. <laughs> yeah, it's a different swing on them. And that's the thing, it gives a whole other ability to it as well. It's kind of show, it's not just make some two twos, it's now make some two twos and I guess have a way to finish the game. Though, drawing five cards in a turn ain't nothing. Even in blue, ain't nothing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, cool. And much harder to kill. Two four, not two two. They've learned. They've learned. You know, they just they didn't give us a tower reprint. They went, let's just maybe for once <laughs> change what Tower Rand does. Yeah. Uh, cool. Right, on to Isu, the abominable. Abom- abominable? Ab- abominable. There we go. Sorry. Uh, three, three. Isu, the abominable. Thank you. Um, three blue blue for a five five. It's a legendary snow creature yeti. Um, whoop, whoop. You, may, you may look at the top card of your library at any time. You may play snow lands and cast snow spells from the top of your library. Yeah. Whenever another snow permanent enters the battlefield under your control, you may pay green or white or blue. If you do, put a plus one plus one counter on Isu the Abominable. That Victor Adame Minguez artwork is rad. Mm-hmm. So cool. The, uh, Victor Adame Minguez also did the Argus Cos artwork, it should be said. But this is proper, like, classic Minguez, where it's essentially just one colour, but in different hues. Like, mm-hmm. you know, it's just uh, the drowned... Uh, drowned Oh, what is the Dimir Shockland? Dimir Aqueduct. No, that's the Oh, Shocklands, Watery Grave. Watery Grave, thank you. So the Watery Grave that he did for the Secret Lair, where it's all the Exilani pirates drowned in the in the sea. Like, and it's all just blue. Mm. Like, yeah, this is this is the Mingas at their absolute best. Um, continue, also, I love ca- this character. Campsite, campsite for scale as well. He yes, huge. Campsite for scale. Yeah, this guy is massive. Yeah. Um, so, wait, wait, shit. what do they do? I've lost myself. I've lost myself. Um, so, um, I've already, I already listed what they do. Oh, yes, you did. I said, yeah. I, said, I, said, I said all the shit. So, I mean, yeah, okay, it's another, uh, dr- not dream halls, uh, f- uh, peer into the few bloody, what's it called? Uh, two blue, 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 blue. You can look at your top card of your library, play it, and you, uh, play it. I can't remember. Oh, anyway, this, I used so, to play it. No, future. <laughs> future side. There future we go. Side. Got there. Fantastic. Got the garbling three. Um, so the thing about this card that really annoys me, and it's one of the, I, I very rarely say this about anything, and that's why not just make it five color? No, no. Because you don't, don't you no. don't have Jorn synergies. You can't no. use Nafi. You can't even play Stalking Yeti, a red snow creature. Like uh, strongly, uh, strongly uh, disagree. But there There's is so no many point. Cool snow if we cards, have the color pie, Nathan. Them. If we have the color pie, we've got to use the goddamn color pie. Otherwise, fine. they'll just take it away from us, and everything fine. will be five color, and this will just be some other I shitty just, card game. I'm just curious as to what denotes this being specifically bank colors as opposed to any. To well, we'll cool. never know because they be don't have any them. character. Are they? Not, they might not be very red and no, black. They've not justified it. Yeah. But, but anyway, but I'm happy about that. No, it doesn't yeah. go into a Jorn deck. But this and this is this is the mechanical but snow permanence and snow synergies aren't color dependent. 
No. So you wouldn't have everything being in Sultai colours. Yeah, that's I, that's the thing that kind of I guess not frustrates me, but I'm sure there are snow players out there like they just kind of want to play with the with all of the options available. Yeah, because I get as a it. tribe, it's a little understated. Like so I looked through all of the different snow cards, and there are like 117 of them or, or, or something like that. But once you cut out two colours, you're very limited on the things you can play. Well, the good thing they is didn't, you can they now didn't play do Diamond a werewolf. Fairy. They didn't do a werewolf tribal deck as part of Midnight Hunt's precon, so they can fuck off by giving yeah, snow permanents everything. <laughs> true, 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 true. Okay, cool. Right, let's move on to Kenosos, uh, Priest of Thassa. Yeah. Um, so we don't have to do much theory crafting on where this person's from because clearly they're off a they're a tribe. Theros, Theros. Theros. Yeah. We Good go. job. Well done, sir. Well done. Yes, gold star. Uh, so one and a blue for a legendary Merfolk cleric. Um, a one three. If you would scry a number of cards, scry that many cards plus one instead three and then hybrid simic look at the top card of your library if it's a kraken leviathan octopus or serpent creature card you may put it onto the battlefield if you don't put the card on the bottom if you don't put it onto the battlefield you may put it on the bottom of your library yeah so you probably don't, i mean i so i have a big i have a big win for this one and do you know why it's because it combines a, a, it combines tribal and, and like like creature tribal and mechanical tribal and then makes it synergistically work together. Okay, I like it when tribal commanders also use another theme to complement the flavor, being a, being being a scry lord, like denoting the, the the feeling of peering into the depths to reveal mm. the monsters below. Mm. How is that not cool? And it's already a, it's already a theme in Quest for the Ulysses Temple. You know, it makes cramming all your beef big big bluefy beefy you know sea creatures into your deck not too bad if you're also then able to scry them to the bottom if you don't need them quite yet. You mm. know. Like it's even Simicos, so you can put play Kiora in the deck and all the Kioras in the deck. Do you not just like the the term like Leviathans, octopuses, serpents, octopuses? Like, come on, dude. No, I've been you. As people can probably hear my sort of audible clicks and things as Nathan's been talking, as if I'm gearing up to say something, and he's just segued perfectly into it. So I'm glad I held off. Um, no, I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> Kraken, Crack. Leviathan, Octopus, or Serpent. I know we're about 100 episodes away from when we did our The Great Snake debate, where we basically, at the time, mm. pontificated on all the creature types that were contentious and whether they should be in the game, whether they should be tidied up, whether they should be spread out, and all the which ones. Pretty good episode. Go listen to it. It's well out of date now because a bunch of creature types came in directly after we had that episode, but whatever. Um, no, they should, Arata, I'm going to sneeze. One second. Bless you. Thank you. Um, they should errata all of those into, I don't know, Kraken. Fish. Just fish. <laughs> Everything fish now. Every time <laughs> they print... God, that sneeze. Really... <laughs> it's really got you. <laughs> One second. Oh, I'm going to have to edit out some noises. Um, every time they print a card that has Serpent, Leviathan, Kraken, Octopus, it's wasted energy <laughs> it's wasted ink it's wasted text box time and the fact that every card that cares about those creature types has all the other creature types on it just proves to me that someone at wizards is going please just make them all of our things i don't fucking care anymore like i don't know bit of a boring i don't really care i mean personally i don't really care about thassa's priest they're not thassa they're not cura great I don't know. I'm quite down on this one. I think it's a bit of a wasted print equity, but sure. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, man. Sorry. That's I'm glad fine. I'm happy. I'm glad I went on my diatribe before before you you just slapped it all down. Well, imagine least... if I said that before and you had to say, "Oh, I, I like." No, my... I wish you had because that would be and flavorfully tribal. <laughs> it is this fucking anyway? Cool. That's fine. I appreciate. I appreciate exactly the kind of, and this is why I called it out. Like right at the end, I was like, "Is it the fact that there's this kind of like?" It's almost like um, a, a meme at this point of like, what's the Kraken, Leviathan, Octopus, or Serpent card? Like you can put it in your bingo sheet, you know, for, yeah. for sets and stuff. And I do, I do get it. I just feel like this is probably one of the better ways for them to make the deck viable. So for those that do like it, there's a nice, I guess what, being an easy win is probably also bad in terms of magic. Go find your theme more difficult to, to, to adhere to. Don't just take the easy option. All right, anyway, speaking I, of No, which, I also have, I have one last little flavor dig just okay. throw in at the end. That's the <laughs> interesting bit. Um, what if we're talking commander purposes? Mm. What color identity is Corona Uh Simic. Simic, cool. What god has blue green as part of their color identity? Uh, Crefix. Yeah, yeah. 
not much just, of a priest of Thassa, is it? Well, I mean, he's blue aligned. He just can do a little bit of maybe it doesn't. So the thing about hybrid, right? Let's, okay, let's <laughs> dive on no, hybrid, man. Let's no, do it. we're not right, doing so, hybrid. So none of, we're not none, none a hybrid of, debate. Okay, right. Okay, cool. Fine. Right, Ashcoat, the Shadow Swarm. <laughs> Here, you got another rat commander, you freaks. You did it. You know, after, <laughs> after getting really, uh, after getting really annoyed that you, I'm well, not annoyed, but I imagine you must have been sorely missing the fact that both of the legendary rats from um, Neon Kamigawa were. <laughs> Were like vehicle related mm, or ninjutsu mm. related you didn't get anything relating to your to your rat tribe um so you won't be disappointed here you know like there are clearly at least dozens of rat <laughs> commander players out there and if some of you didn't want to be playing your super shiny you know secret lair version of marinora here's here's another option yep. is it better i don't know is it more interesting i don't know i mean i think it's interesting to have another option also it's an albino rat what does it so, do it, oh right, yeah, cool. Sorry, yeah, fair enough. Uh, Ashko of the Shadow Swarm, sick name, by the way. Yeah, three in cool. a black, three four. Um, for a legendary rat creature, rat, um, sorry, a legendary creature rat warlock. Whenever Ashko of the Shadow Swarm attacks or blocks other rats you control, get plus X plus X until end of turn where X is the number of rats you control. At the beginning of your end step, you may mill four cards. If you do, return up to two rat creature cards from your graveyard to your hand. Yeah. So. I don't know. I mean, so Marinora gives all your rats fear. You tap, you make a bunch of rats equal to the number of rats you control, kind of like Krenko. So is this more interesting? Yes, probably. Like, do I think it's better? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. But it's another option, you know. So I think yeah. it's at least interesting to have in the 99. You know, I, I love the idea of a rat warlock as well. Yeah. I think um, rats in general, they, they obviously play with this uh, trope in Neon... Uh, dynasty and it's something that we actually spoke about at length when we talked about the old versus new Kamigawa where they played around with the trope of the idea that rat folk on many planes are seen as being sort of like the scourge and the least tech like produced and the stupidest and all this kind of thing whereas in Kamigawa they were able to keep up tech wise and were even like you know the pilots of the best vehicles and stuff whereas the mm-hmm. the moon folk were like hey we're building big mechs all of the rat folk were like hey we're building like cyber bikes and shit and like bank busters that can fuck you up so I like that they played with that trope. Yeah, for sure. I also like, I think Warlock here is much better than Wizard, you know, or Druid yes. or Shaman. Like, this is yeah. one of the cards I'm like, yeah, this, this is where the the, the uh, class type really, really favours um, favors the, the flavour of the card. Um, and looking in the back, it, that does that look neon Kamigawa to you with the little no, circles I don't, in the back? No, I don't think I think this, this might be old school. Like, again, being like that Warlocky magic, again, yeah. being an albino kind of gives me a big, um, god damn it, Inkai's vibes, you know? And again, I didn't realize, I thought for some reason there was like two or three different options to play as your rat commander for a relentless rats deck or whatever version of the of the rats you're playing. Um, but it turns out this is only the second proper legendary apart from Inkai, and this is way more synergistic. So, yeah, this, you know. uh, this artwork as well by, um, oh God, I had it up. Oh, Christina Krauss. Christina Krauss. Yeah. Um, is going to look sick in foil as well. Oh, right. Yeah, that's going to be awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I said I didn't bring up uh, Caroline uh, Gabina either for Alandra Sky Dreamer. I really like that color palette. Um, yeah, the red it's and very blue cool. off each other. The arts for these in general are very, are very strong, um, very evocative. Uh, with maybe one exception that we'll get to in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, moving on from one cool name, Ashcoat of the Shadow Swarm, we get Ru- Rodolf. Rodolf, seasonal. Now, Yay, Rodolf. <laughs> is it? Is it not? This is. I would say or Rodolf. R- Rodolf. Rodolf. Either way, it sounds Rodolf. 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 It sounds ridiculous. Um, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's where we've got to in our, in our humour here. Cool. On the podcast. Uh, Rodolph Duskbringer, five black for a 4 4 legendary creature, a vampire angel. Mm. Flying Death Touch lifelink. Whenever you gain life, <laughs> Rodolph Duskbringer gains indestructible until end of turn. At the beginning of your end step, you may pay one and hybrid uh, Orzov. When you do, return target creature with mana value X or less from your graveyard to the battlefield where X is the amount of life you gained this turn. Mm. Interesting, right? Mm. Cost six mana. So, mm. I mean, we're not here to talk about viability. Um, this is where flavor text would be really helpful. Yeah. He's a fucking vampire angel, the first yeah. of his bloody kind. And we have nothing, no explanation as to how that's possible. Nope. Why it's possible. Nope. What, what it means. Nope. It's fucking. Oh, God damn I mean, it. <laughs> I don't. I, for a start, I don't think this is in Astradi. Absolutely not. Because no. the vampires on that plane were made by a sacrifice of angel blood, and I don't understand how I just don't understand how it seem, I'm seeming more. To, what it looks like to me, right? Because it's got wings. Um, so again, this is we're not we're not a visual podcast, um, but it's got big fluff, fluffy, typical normal angelic wings, which makes me feel like 
again male angel also interesting another yeah. another thing that's interesting because clearly to me it looks like it was an angel that has been you know subject to whatever version of vampirism is on this plane it looks old school so it's got like a wooden bracketed chandelier so it's got to be it's not like any of the i guess modern sets but i mean being a vampire angel you know it's pretty I mean, much it, given it, for that anyway is the name the... so you got lyra dawnbringer mm-hmm so this is Ro- Rodolph Duskbringer. So maybe, is this not Dominaria? Maybe Dominaria. I think it could be something. It could even be potentially Ixalan, because I think the, the the garb might be. And we haven't. We've only seen like the very beginnings of um. What's the bloody continent called? Teres Teresica or whatever it is. Where the uh, vampires Torazon. come from. Torazon. Sorry. Yeah. And there's a chance that you know again that's a curse. Who, who, yeah. we, we can only ask, right? I mean, it's the best goddamn vampire Nighthawk printed yet. You know, <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Talking from a more sort of like deck constructy uh, color pie thing here. So I play. It's no secret I play Karlov, and there's lots of big sort of Orzovy life gainy death touchy use your life to do a thing commanders and 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 legendaries in that deck. Basically, anytime there's a new one, I think, oh, does this have a slot? It's so saturated now that at six mana, this this one doesn't make it. Uh, (laughs) It doesn't make it in that deck. Isn't that sad? It's a very Mm. interesting card and it aesthetically fits in perfectly, but it just doesn't fit in with all the other ones Mm. (laughs) that have been printed. I know, right? And I guess, again, six mana, I think, is the killer. It's also kind of unfortunate there was a five mana mono white version of this in the Warhammer Imperius deck. Um, whenever you gain life, you return something. It was at the beginning of your own steps. I think Rachel Weeks played it on... um, on the extra turns episode sure um so yeah so it's annoying that also that that effect has kind of technically been printed on a more efficient body but you know again vampire angel is cool you can now do all of your vampire angel synergies that you wanted to do before and you can now do it here i guess yeah i mean yeah there there are big questions over over this character and you know rodolph had... man rodolph <laughs> yeah i mean it'd be in... if this is a dominarian character It'd be interesting to see how a character like Arvad the Cursed would interact with them. Yeah, and again, but it, aren't, aren't angels beings of white man, white mana manifestations? Even yeah, on... but I mean, all right. So, is this an angel that's been affected by vampirism, or that's, is this a vampire, is a vampire that's, that's ascended to being an angel? Yeah, it would be quite cool on, say, someone like Nuka Penna, which this clearly isn't on because nah, they have this weird quality Penna. between their because de- you know, like they have their ability to take on demonic qualities with their packs, and you know, there was like, there's still question marks over whether, whether Elspeth has some angelic quality to her. You know, Giada was kind of interesting, like I don't know, but it's clearly not there either. Again, flavor text would be lovely. Uh, maybe <laughs> we will still get that article. I mean, this is still only coming out very, very recently, right? We might still get an article giving us a bit of backstory on all of them. It would be uh, nice. I doubt it, but sure. So <laughs> but yeah, cool. Um, let's <laughs> now. This is my like my secret favorite pick out of all of them. Um, Ardos, Cobbler of War. Two mana. A, in, I'm in. That's it. I'm yeah, building a deck. W- w- one and a red for a one-one haste. Whenever um, Ardos, Cobbler of War, or another creature enters the battlefield under your control, it gets plus two plus zero until end of turn. Three mm. and a red create a one-one red goblin creature token with haste. Activate only as a sorcery. Mm. Um, this guy makes shoes. It's it's it makes it's a foot armor that gives your creatures like sweet ass pumps that I guess like break at the end of turn because you only get the plus two for that for that turn. Yeah, I can't decide. So the artwork by uh, Kev Walker, amazing Kev Walker by the way, mm-hmm. have, have them back. I can't decide whether I like the fact that he didn't give her swift foot boots. Or well, because swift boots don't break, right? And she hasn't got she hasn't got shroud or you, I mean you've got to give her permanent boots. She makes temporary <laughs> so I, I suppose well i suppose that's it isn't it like they're crude versions because like yeah, exactly. so in in the artwork you've got um our dolls and she's kicking around in these shoes but they're like iron raw like wrought iron shoes with holes in them like mm. air holes with jets of flame shooting out of them so i suppose it's almost like she's found the blueprints to a set of lightning greaves and kind of smashed them together yeah like as goblins do which i quite like all right, I mean, maybe I do like it. Right, the thing that annoys me is she's a goblin shaman when she should be a goblin artificer. Oh yeah, because she's making shoes. You know, I guess you know the shoes require magic to go, but you know. Um, so now, probably what, what the, the greatest question mark I think be, beyond Rodolph the yeah, what the hell is going on angel. here? What is this card? Auntie Blight, bad influence. Two and a red for a legendary creature, <laughs> Devil, Devil Advisor. <laughs> 2-2 two, two flying, whenever a source you control deals damage to you, put that many plus one plus one counters on, art, on, on Auntie Blight black, bad influence. One red tap, remove X11 one, one counters from Auntie Blight, it deals X damage to any target. I fucking 
Love this card. So you won't know this again. We're not a <laughs> we're not a video podcast. The artwork on here is bonkers. Yeah. It's so weird. It's I it's I don't even know Tatiana Kurgatova. If I've got that right, I'm a G, I'm, I'm crazy good with it. Um, has only done five cards in Magic, including this. Oh, One of which being the re, the redo with Runa and uh, Ruth, uh, not Ruth, Rutha and the or the Archmage from from the Quandrix. Oh, the Quandrix screen. student. Yeah, um, the two of them on Ristic Study. Um, she's, she's also done. Is Zimone, that's it. Yeah, she's also done Jailbreak, um, Laziel's Acrobatics, and Primeval Herald. So two of the other, it's only five cards, two of which um, the other two are within within this set. And it's really strangely cartoony. Do you know what this reminds me of? Um, Warner Brothers, like Looney Tunes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This gives me massive Looney Tunes vibes. She's got like these kind of secretary glasses on. She's wearing like this cute little like dress. Like she's like, it's, but what she is essentially is your bad conscience. So I said the little devil on your shoulder, which is a massive flavor miss because they didn't give us the good influence side of it, which yes, would have just been a boring counters for life game angel version, you know, but uh, like it would have been interesting to see the, what the good influence side would have looked like. Um, but the whimsy in the artwork just kind of places it in a really strange what I can only personify as because it's not Rakdossi, it's not in a Stradi at all. No, because it's got they've got glasses. They've yeah, got like, horn rim glasses. So it must be it, to me it feels almost like Strixhaven-y. I, but they did they, I don't think they had devils on Strixhaven, you know? Like and it's it's, it's very tiny devil. Like no idea. Again, Where is, yeah, this, this, nice. is the this one. could be Preston. This could be Preston playing. Yeah, for this sure. this is exactly the card where I was like, this feels like they were trying to go like, let's do an unset, but let's not make it like super push. Let's just kind of yeah. do like kind of almost like po face jumps um po faced unsets, and that's what they're using this jump start thing for. Yeah. Mm. I mean I love the ability. Really cool. Yeah, yeah, it really puts you Very in a box interesting. and Never, like, makes it really red. I might build this deck, you know. Because you can one-shot people with this if you do the right combos of, of damage to yourself. I mean, you can do some really cool shit. Because like, you all your double damage, damage, your damage doublers, a lot of them are like things that you control, um, things that you control deal double damage, but your opponents don't. So you can yeah. do some really cool effects with that. It might end up playing quite linearly, but again, it's two and a red. So it's I think it's I think it's doable. And again, it's do- it's doing something interesting, you know. It's letting it's it's every time something bad happens to you, the, it's almost like that creates the the bad thing back, right? How did I put it before? I was like, um, da 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 da, ba ba ba, um, I I can't potentially I can't I, I apparently didn't write it down. Never mind, never mind. I wrote something about it being a bad conscience. I mean, yeah, doesn't matter. <laughs> it, it was interesting. I just think artwork wise, yeah, I'd love to know where where from would be nice. Yeah, Maybe we'll know one day. Um, moving on to green. Um, and nope. no, are we not. Where have I, where have I missed? Oh, cool. Because I'm not on the right page. That's why. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. Um, so our second Ravnica outing out of the yep. fourteen, which is interesting. I mean, actually, it's not that interesting because Ravnica has a shitload of legendaries across thousands of years <laughs> of lore. So actually, it makes quite a lot of sense. Uh, Mizzix, replica rider. She's uh, back. F- four and a red uh, for a legendary creature, goblin wizard. Uh, four five with flying. Whenever you cast a spell from anywhere other than your hand, you may pay one Is It hybrid. If you do, copy that spell and you may choose new targets for the copy. If the copy is a permanent spell, it gains haste. And at the beginning of your end step, sacrifice this permanent. I uh, can't do Is It copy magic decks. I took yeah. apart Zafai. For anyone who's keeping count, I did a mm-hmm. purge of a lot of my decks. I took apart Zafai because a lot of it was like 10 minute turns where you're copying X, Y, and Z. And I took out all the copy cards that were in it to begin with. Like I didn't have like, you know, all of the classic play at flash Reiterate speed, copy or space. Yeah. Or any of those guys. I just, I couldn't, I can't do it. And mm. these kinds of cards really break my tiny lizard brain. So I won't be building Mizzix, but it's cool that she's back. <laughs> yeah. I think the, I, I guess the idea is right for me, um, beyond actually artwork by uh, Zoltan Boris, um, Mizzix is riding a mech version replica of Niv Mizzet, which yeah. is just bossiest. Um, and I guess that's the idea, right? Is you're supposed to, but it's whenever you cast a spell from anywhere other than your hand. So the way I look at this is it's kind of like a uh, Prosper um, analog of where yeah. all of you got you've got all of these exile spells that don't quite fit into Prosper anymore because all they're doing is just putting things into. A, I mean, yeah, you can obviously they're doing things that Prosper wants to do, but like, you know, it's very redundant. You've got all of these extra ones that are left over. Build a Mizzix deck, do a copy effect. Instead of doing something that's like redundant with artifacts, do something like, because I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, does this go into my Maelstrom Wanderer deck? Because I can cascade into her and then the next spell that I cascade into, I can then copy 
and then I get a copy of that version because I've also got I've also got Nafel sheet. And again, this is maybe uh, inherent of the amount of cards I've printed over the last year. But so many of these effects that are on the card on on some of these cards have have been printed very recently. Mm-hmm. Again, in in the Warhammer Chaos deck, there's uh, a, a effect that happens when things are cast from exile, and then Nafel sheet, which was I guess Boulder's Gate command c- commanders commander Boulder's Gate set. Mm-hmm. That was whenever you cast a spell from exile, you copy it because I've got that in Maelstrom Wonder already. So this is just another version, but as your commander. So you just do all of the exile effects. You can do a bunch of little cascadey effects as well, just the ones that are blue and red. Um, I, th- I think it's cute. It reminds me a lot of Vega, uh, the Watcher, in terms of like, okay, yes. it's just a two color. You play towards this theme. It doesn't feel as egregious as Prosper because it's not self feeding. It's purely payoff, which I think is quite nice because you've got enough enablers anyway. Um, I think yeah. it's cool. Yeah, so and yeah, I mean, Mythics is kind stuff of an... either, right? It's just yeah. copy effects. I guess Mythics is a copy shaman. Oh, sorry, copy wizard. Well, Mythics is an interesting character because in the stories they're presented as being this kind of rival almost to Raul Zarek within the Izzet League. Mm. Um, and is the kind of right hand goblin to Niv Mizzet, whereas Raul is also kind of rising through the ranks, but Raul's sort of. At some points, later points in the story, he is essentially like the the complete right hand of of Niv Mizzet. Well, it's a vice story, versions. is it? Hey? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're an interesting character because they're seen as slightly antagonistic because everyone loves Ral, even though Ral for a lot of the stories is also themselves a bit of a, a kind of grey grey knight, as it were. Um, but they're also shown. They were shown more recently in the artwork for the Secret Lair, which showed Tomic and Ral's wedding. So it was mm. the it was the LGBTQI plus Secret Lair, I think it was. They're they're shown in the card art for that, so they are sort of kind of quietly a bit of a fan favorite. So it is nice that they get another card that's not just uh, Mizix of the Years Magnus. There's also another thing to note on the artwork for this one is that in the Boom Line comics, which is a kind of alternate history to the mainline story, where they've kind of taken from War of the Spark onwards, they've kind of split off in this kind of alternate dimension and like mm-hmm. characters get killed off left, right, and center, like main characters. Uh, Niv Mizzet is instead of being niv Mizzet reborn, they're niv Mizzet as like a, a giant mech dragon, like their spirit is in the dragon. And I don't think it's that's something they're going to do with the uh, main story. So maybe a throw over to that. I think, yeah, or maybe even, I mean, I say I don't think they're going to do it. Maybe this is a softball into it. What, this is like alternate, maybe we do another Plane of Chaos set. Or they're trying like... to float the idea that if people don't completely reject the idea of like riding a mech niv Mizzet copy that in a future Ravnican set they're going to say something like to contain his five color body Niv Mizzet poured his essence into a robot I don't know (laughs) I'm spitballing here but it's kind of it's too close for comfort that they've made her Mm. ride a lot of people are saying that this is the Niv Mizzet mech but it's definitely not absolutely Um, would be way huger than that yeah exactly but I just think that maybe is this like a soft lead in they've been doing lots of those in recent years yeah they did some really cool Merit Lage uh, Merit Lage stuff in the Boom comic series actually like I'm kind of annoyed that they didn't they don't have that as canon I mean it would be too much canon to fit into the modern format but yeah it's very cool I do really want another Plane of Chaos set to be fair I like this idea of alternate realities of random bits of magic and again this again this may be what this is the place where that can happen right is you could do those kinds of uh throwovers and stuff that have actual no like pertinence to any of the rest of the um the grand arts or whatever but yeah cool cool um so from uh interesting old school character to what, why Ugh, um, why kibo, kibo Octa- octavi prince Two and a green for a legendary creature, Monkey Noble. Um, It's a 2-2. Tap. Each player creates a colorless artifact token named Banana. With tap, sacrifice this artifact. Add red or green. You gain two life. Whenever an artifact an opponent controls is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, put a plus one plus one counter on. Each creature you control that's an ape or a monkey. Whenever Kibo attacks, defending player sacrifices an artifact. Are also by Zoltan Boros. Yeah. I... uh... It's a bit meme in it? This is this is a card that got rejected in the latest unset. <laughs> and they were like, well, fuck it, we'll stick it in Jumpstart. If if Auntie Blight and Preston are the ones where they went, oh, we can push the humour a little bit and see where we go. This one, someone went, I, I just really like monkeys, guys. I just, I just really love a monkey. And uh, do you know what monkeys love? They love bananas. We can yeah. make a card which is like bananas. Oh god. 
What yeah, is so, this? So I have it as what a random throwback to Octavia Orangutan because that's all I can imagine is someone really liked Octavia Orangutan and just went, oh, we'll do a throwback to yeah, it. And then it's also, this? like, mechanically, it's a Gruul Artifact Destruction Commander, right? Which has its own, as a deck build quirk's cool, but then all of the payoff is just putting loads of counters on your monkeys and your apes, which aren't exactly a great tribe. But then it, it gives your opponents bananas, and then those bananas are tokens, but they're not food tokens, but you gain life when you sacrifice them. And, and, and they're artifacts? Yeah. So for me, just there's so much random like overwording that it stops feeling like a cool, succinct flavor win. It starts just feeling like a mechanical. Why did they have to put this many words? It's like the, the, I get the way they look at it. The, the way I think they look at it is um, play monkey, give papers banana, profit. And I'm like, cool, yeah, but uh, it's such a mouthful of everything, and every, well, you're really, I, I don't know, I don't know. It feels contrived to to, to the ninth degree. I'm sure when you open up packs of Jumpstart if you're playing this as intended, this is a fun little, like, especially if you are playing with people who aren't necessarily as into magic as you are, because Jumpstart is a very good jumping off point and is, has been marketed as such and proved as such and therefore built on as such as being something to give newer players or something to, like, the, the, the way that I did it is I turned up, I was with uh, someone I was actually taking on a date and she wanted to play magic and I was like, cool, well, I'm not going to chuck you in 1v1 commander because that's just, I just don't think that ever goes well. And so we got a couple of drinks in. I picked up some Dominaria Jumpstart packs and we sat down and played Jumpstart for a couple of hours and then like they got it immediately. So I think if they, if, if we opened Kibo Uktabi Princess, uh, Prince, sorry, in Jumpstart 2022, it'd be a fun little thing of going, oh, isn't magic silly? It's not all just vampires and killing people and murder mm. and Phyrexians. It can also be a little bit whimsical. But beyond that, it's just like... <sighs> I don't know. It's not for me. Yeah. I and don't hate I any individual part of it. Again. <laughs> There's just a lot of parts to it. You yeah. know? So, yeah, no, no, whatever. Um, I, don't, I don't hate it. I don't hate it. I don't love it. Um, moving on to Renardi, Behemoth Caller. Um, this is another, maybe just has one too many lines of text on it. But um, mm. two and a green. Well, it doesn't have flavor text, so it could have had one more line of text. On it. That would have been nice. <laughs> um, two and a green for a 1 3 legendary creature, Cat Shaman. Whenever you cast a creature spell with val- mana value 5 or greater, that creature enters the battlefield with X additional plus 1 plus 1 counters on it, where X is its mana value minus 4. Creatures you control with 3 or more plus 1 plus 1 counters on them have haste. Um, oh wait, no, sorry, I was wrong. It does have flavor text. Tap, add green. Because <laughs> that's literally how it feels. That why yeah. did it have to have a random tap, add green on it's green? It? I because, mean, because it's green. It's got to do the. Th- it's not only got to give you the payoff. It's also got to help you get to the payoff, right? It's because green's not good shaman. enough. Shaman, what about cat cats? Has ever been tapped for a green? Yeah, right. I mean, so the negatory to that as well is that the the Nakata, which this is clearly a, a, a one of, because I mean, I this is Naya, right? Um, mm. which I, I love is, is this post uh, post merge I hope so which means we might still go there we hope so it's a highly anticipated return to block maybe one day anyway um, it, it plays also mana value great 5 or greater which is like power 5 or greater from the original Alara uh, block that was the mechanic it played into um, I think it's a cool card it makes Gouter terrifying <laughs> um, yeah. but again I just feel like it's 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 the abilities on it are a little bit of a throwback to the, the cats of, of um, Naya but it doesn't really for me feel evocative of the cats of Naya scenes and the cattle were very aggressive and it was more the the elves that were doing the whole tapping to add mana to boost up your to boost up your big guys so I'm not sure why this is a cat card instead of an elf card considering the flavor of Naya but I'd like the fact we're getting a throwback to Alara at yeah. least mechanically, it does feel like a, a if you had a Naya deck, a Naya theme deck, you put this in there and it works, mm. right? So I don't think it's a bad thing necessarily. Though, though nice. Mana value five or greater is very different to, to power five or greater. Very true. Nice little uh, visual nod from Billy Christian in the artwork. The spear that um, Renardi's holding is very similar to the axes that Ajani wields, obviously being from mm-hmm. uh, sort of a cat cat family on that plane i don't know it's a nice little visual tie-in it's fine it's very it's it's very there <laughs> yeah it's just yeah. it's there it's not a card you hate having your deck it probably does a ton of work but as your commander i don't think it's super super exciting beyond being a mini crater hoof effect which yeah. may you know again it's fine um Cool, moving on to the last, um, I don't think least, but um, I guess I guess we'll find out as we get through it. Zask, Skittering Swarmlord. Um, mm. Three green green for a 5-5 five, five legendary creature insect. 
You may play lands and cast insect spells from your graveyard. Whenever another insect you control dies, put it on the bottom of its owner's library and then mill two cards. One Golgari hybrid target insect gets plus one, plus zero, and gains death touch until end of turn. Mm. I don't hate this. Nope. It's grist, but not grist. So I guess one day, eventually, this insect deck's going to happen, and it's <laughs> yeah. Well, that's be, exactly what I thought. It's probably going to be really, really average. Wants an insect deck, yeah. It's going to happen one day. Does Blex work with this? Because Blex gives plus one plus one to insects and pests, right? As well, I think. So I mean, you're getting there with all of these random Golgari legends. Is I don't know if it's better than grist. I think grist works obviously really well with this, and it works really well together. I still don't think there are enough insects. Um, but you know, it also has the lands thing again. This is one thing we haven't, I haven't, I haven't said properly. Um, but the fact that all of these commanders do like c- can work on two different axes, or some some of them very clearly work on it does this theme and this theme is specific because of jumpstart liking to like merge two different packs together. Um, and this one feels a little bit kind of like that, where it's like, okay, the insect synergy isn't super strong if you get a random pack that doesn't have any insects in it. What else are you doing? Oh, okay, I guess you can at least play lands. Mm. You know, so it covers its own ass there in terms of not being completely useless. And then as a thematic for a commander deck, I think playing a lands plus insects tribal deck works in the same way that playing a <coughs> Kraken's Leviathan's Optimus <laughs> Serpents and Scry deck can work, you know, where sure. you've got mechanical work flavor as well as tribal flavor. My problem with insect legendaries, and it, it somewhat extends to Hydras and Oozes and Oh gosh, damn it! I'm playing right into their hands as I say this. It, I find them very hard to get anything out of them if I if I don't know anything about them. Yeah. Um. What's the personality? Yeah, Does I know one? that none of them have flavor text. We've been saying that all throughout this episode. It's been like kind of the through line. But oh god, this is the whole planeswalker bipedal planeswalker thing where mm-hmm. we've been screaming like, "No, give us non-humanoid, non-bipedal planeswalkers." But I'm exactly I'm using exactly their logic for the legendaries, and I feel I really hate myself for doing it. But but I don't mind Grist as the Planeswalker. There was something there, but still very hard to connect with in a way that mm. Renan Six. I kind of have them in the sort of same sphere. Wasn't there was a bit more like character warmth there, and mm. I just feel that there's a lot of Hydras and insects and things. And some players don't give a shit about this, so I'm not talking to them. This is a flavor podcast. Some of them do just feel a little bit like I don't. I don't know what this is. Yeah. Is it just a really, really big bug? Yeah. Is that the thing that makes it legendary? Because there are certain things that make something legendary that like, you know, be it, as we said, like a per- an aspect of personality or a specific magic that no one else can do, you know, or you're a fish out of water, one tribe into another tribe kind of thing. But this yeah. is just like, are you just the biggest bug? Yeah. And it'd be nice to know, like, do you have, you know, are you just a formidable, are you like Granax or whatever the fucking Golgari Hydra horror from... Because Hydra Horror, really cool creature type. And it's just on some random beast. Zaxara? Right? Is that what you're uh, No, Zaxara is the Soltai one. It's the one that you can. that um, that makes a token copy of itself. Oh, sure, 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 sure. Growlnack or Graznak or something. And it's from the Sky, <laughs> Sky Ruin or whatever. It's oh, from. Yeah, yeah, it is Growlnack. Yeah, yeah. From. Um, from... Zendikar Rising. Zendikar Rising, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's why I mean, there are some that are just like bestial. And it's like, okay, I, I feel like even something like Polychronos, which was. You know, um, Elspeth's greatest triumph. And yeah, the Blue Chronos had a story, though. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. Without having a story and without even a little bit of flavor text to kind of denote of a, of a greater story, these are very wishy washy, cool, it's just a big bug kind of thing, right? Yeah. Like, Kibo, for all its flaws, has a lot of flavor in of what it does. And uh, how it yeah, it's got a personality. It's exactly. just not a personality I'd invite around for a beard. You know? right, right, exactly. <laughs> that's the idea, right? Sometimes you only need to call, give a character a name like Rodolphe for it and, and give it a cool creature type for it to give intrigue. Um, yes. you know, yeah, there's and, very, that's it. There's very little intrigue. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like, Vishino Planeswalker that got killed off in five seconds, although I'm loath to say anything positive about those books, had at least a little bit of e- intrigue. Because <laughs> mm, you're like, oh, um, who's that? Wow, interesting. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Bug in just... the Forest yeah. is less so. But, you know, exactly. I'm happy to be proven wrong when we get our like side stories in the next couple of years where they follow the life and times of Zask, mm-hmm. Skittering Swarm Lord. And it turns out to be like Son of Grist or some weird shit. I don't know. Forget it. Anyway. Yeah. But yeah, exactly. So I think that's kind of the reason why I wanted to, like, to talk about all of these is because this is kind of a really good example of how to get back to the bread and butter of like what we like doing this podcast, which is taking cards and investigating the flavor of them. We don't have to think about a grand story implication. We haven't got 250 of them to sift through to find the ones that we like. We just get, here are 14 characters. 
does their card give a cool flavor you know explanation yeah. of who they are even with even without having any of them having any flavor text which might have been what <laughs> for better or for worse did it make it more interesting to try and take the flavor out of their out of their cards or not i don't know again some of them clearly needed it i think other than, others did well without it um so yeah do you know what looking through the other legendaries the re- the reprints in this jumpstart set black is absolutely killing it in the color pie the black legendaries in this set are coffer fed soul hoarder liliana death's majesty which is the amonkhet one with the chris ron art that's banging saizan mm. perverter of truth obnixilus the hate twisted which is the war of the spark one so conrad the grim because they reprinted all the knights tivesh gloom summoner who's one of the more interesting uh strixhaven commander deck ones Yargle, Clutton of Urborg, and Vito, Thorn of the Dusk Rose. Mm. Fucking what? <laughs> Red also did quite well, but like, like that's absolutely wild. Anyway, sidebar. Mm. Second sidebar. Jump in before you say anything, because I'm, I'm pushy like that. Mm. Uh, we get uh, Khan Liberated as a reprint in the set with a lovely anime artwork, which is wonderful. Mm. The other ones that get anime treatments are Balan Wandering Knight, which is kind of interesting. But you also get um, Arlen, Voice of the Pack, and Kazmina, Eg- Enigmatic Mentor. Which already had which anime already treatments. Had anime yeah. treatments. Though I do think Arlen looks, you know, I mean, I'm not going to say it, but you know, she she DTF. <laughs> um, I, kind of, I'm glad that you segued sure. into this. This was the last, like, my last footnote that I wanted to say, and oh, that's definitely getting cut. Um, <laughs> um, oh, I want but, everyone to know what kind of a creep you are. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm going to be creepier still. That there's so many people that kind of got up in arms about this anime treatment. Some of them being like, "Oh, why?" You know, like there are some, you know, that certain people are like, yeah, they're definitely going for a certain thing. Where this is like, yeah, and they've been doing it now for a little while. Yes, get off your high horse. It's anime is in magic, and I kind of really like, like, look how cute Stitcher's supplier looks. Yeah, and it's giving like a really cool treatment to an expensive card and giving it another an option for it. You know, spell starter sprite looks cool. Mirror image is dank. I'm getting it. I, I I've cut mirror image from so many decks that now I'm going to put it back into <laughs> because I like the artwork so much. Like a foil version of that with a little fucking fox mask on the side of the head. Hell yeah, I'm into that shit. Yeah, yeah I, I I really like them. I feel like this is another thing that Dumpstart can do quite well. Like it maybe is this deliberate because we had Kamigawa this year? I hope so because it means that maybe next year's Jumpstart 2023 will do a similar thing with whatever their big theme of um, all will be one or march of the machines whichever set they, they maybe you know take the trope from in because mm. that might be why they did it here because otherwise they could have just done a bunch of different alternate artworks right but it was all anime so yeah i think the I don't khan think... looks cool yeah i think the khan looks cool what's the other one that looked really really cool there was another blue card i mean balan wandering knight's really cool um there was another one that i really like the look of uh oh whirl of rogue yeah whirl of rogue it gives me massive ghibli vibes like big fan. Whirl Rogue is one of those cards, just speaking as a card, where I'm like, if there's ever a deck that I can play Whirl Rogue in, they go straight in. I've got such mm. a love for that card. So really cool, cool card, yeah. Cool. Well, that's anyway. a nice little bit of random, like, woo, 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 at the end of the episode. So, yeah, yeah jumpstart 2023. Uh, 2023 I don't sorry. mind doing a bit of woo woo. I woo woo with you all the time. Aw, I woo woo with you too. Ah. Good. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Right, can we uh, shut the episode so we can finish this lovely sexy date we're having? Yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> um, let us know what you think on Twitter at MT Flavoring. You can almost e- almost you can almost email us if you really try hard enough. You can almost also email us at uh, mtflavoring at gmail.com. My personal Twitter is at Andy Manface. Nathan's yours is at the Fox in the Moon. Woo! Uh, hey, yeah. yeah. <laughs> for those of you that obviously have been listening to us for a while, you know that we're fans of the Command Sphere podcast. Um, and it looks like they're coming to a bit of a close. By the time this episode comes out, their last episode, as we know it might have also been uh, released. Um, Rachel Weeks uh, and Dan Sheen, who have been hosting the Command Sphere podcast, Rachel is moving off to become part of the command zone team which is very exciting for them uh, and obviously a move that wasn't taken lightly because you can always tell on their episodes how much dan and rachel really uh, enjoyed each other's company uh, and obviously when you play magic and be friends for a long time the reason i bring this up is not only because i'm a fan i know you've like you're quite a big fan as well but because they started around the same time as us uh, i think they released their episodes about two or three months before we did and they're one of the first kind of content creators that we reached out to on twitter and stuff and uh yeah 
I just we always recommend this on the pod, on recommend them on this podcast. It is a bit of a, an end of an era for content creation because mm-hmm. I think the voices that they had within the magic community. I mean, Rachel's on the CAG and you know all that kind of thing. But as a as their own product, you know, as their own voice, that the things that they espouse in their podcast, I think I agreed with a lot of the time. Um, their kind of level headedness. So yeah. I just wanted to give a little shout out to them. It was a little bit of a bittersweet moment when I found out that their podcast is going to be changing. But Dan is still going to be making content under uh, sort of the command sphere umbrella, if you like. Um, so I hope he has great success for that. And I wish Rachel all the best as well. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. All right. Anything else to say, Nathan? Um, it's nearly Christmas. <laughs> Maybe we'll do something about it next week. Who knows? Oh, it sounds like you got an idea. I don't. I I didn't until literally this exact moment, and now I do. So that's good. Cool. Wonderful. I guess. Listen out. And then also, we'll be doing a year in, re- re- year in review soon. Ooh, ooh. A, re- a year in review <laughs> soon. God damn it. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, so that'll be interesting. That'll be good to see. It's, I, it's, I'm not sure. I'm going to have to re listen to our year in review from last year to see kind of what we. Just to remind myself exactly what happened last year as well. Do you know what I re listened to of ours again? I re listened again to the multiverse menu. Yeah. Still one of our oh, best episodes, be, I think. Which yeah. is, and it's also like that was only halfway through our run, which is wild when I think about it now. It's like episode sixty one, sixty two, mm. something like that. Do you know what in that episode is just dates it so fucking hard? Is that we talk about the underworld cookbook, and I try and pronounce Asmarano Mari Kadosin the Calder Car, or like off the top of my dome, and obviously I flunk it, and then you say. Oh well, you know they'll never print a card with that name on it because it's too long. <laughs> and then they went and did it <laughs> without mana cost. They, they made it happen. They yeah, made in it the most beautiful way. Yeah, fantastic. So, keep, keep surprising us, magic. Yeah, so do go and listen to that episode. I genuinely think we have such a cracking time on it, and I think it's one of the best sort of like uh, concept episodes that we've done. Um, mm. But it, it it does have. There's a couple of other things in there, both personal and like magic wise, where I'm like, God damn, that dates that episode. But Go listen to it. I, I suggest you do so. <gasps> Thank you so much for listening. This has been Magic the Flavoring. We'll see you soon. Ooh woo. Ooh woo.